it's, it's a real pleasure to be here um, towards the close of, of uh, the conference. Um, as Robert will know, and as I've mentioned, mortgages keep finding their way back into my career. Um, I started my career, um, actually spent around about eight years as a mortgage broker. Um, so I'm familiar with many of the issues you're dealing with, certainly many of the considerations that you have to make. And actually coming back here today has actually brought back some of my careers, early career as a mortgage broker because I started covering three branches. Three branches that were separated by about 15 miles in any one direction and branch staff who actually thought it was funny to book me into appointments 10 minutes apart with 15 miles to travel. So having been in our board meeting at half past two, um, that brought quite a lot of it back to me this morning, afternoon. So, earlier today we published a consultation paper uh, seeking your views on how we implement the Mortgage Credit Directive and those of you who have been following uh, the trade press would have seen that's got a fair bit of coverage so far today. It also talks about how we're going about implementing the new regime for second charge mortgages. And given how busy we all are, I think an implementation date of 21st of March 2016 may actually feel like a dot on the landscape, something we don't need to worry too much about just yet, um, but we're consulting now so that we can take your views we can analyse those and we can publish the final rules as far advanced in, of implementation as possible um, to give you enough time to plan and adjust. And I think it's going to be a major challenge for all of us over that period. Now you'll be delighted to hear, almost as delighted as I was, that I'm not going to go into uh, too much of the technical detail and into the proposals in meticulous detail this afternoon. Uh, instead what I want to do is take the opportunity to talk to you uh, about our recent strengthening of mortgage regulation and how that's influenced the directive and also at a high level what the directive will mean for you and your firms. And I'll also cover our approach to second charge mortgages as well. So perhaps a good place to start is the mortgage market review, um, which many of you will have lived and breathed over the last few years. I've lived and breathed it in various guises at the regulator, both, both in policy and also in supervision um, and in one of the cross-cutting sector teams. And that work, as you know, culminated in a final set of rules that came into effect in April. Those of you who were here yesterday will have heard from Linda Blackwell. Um, on the teething issues and how firms' processes are bedding down, but in time we believe the MMR will prove testament to the way in which the industry and the regulator can work together uh, with the common aim of delivering a sustainable mortgage market that functions in consumers' best interests. And as we work through these changes to the domestic regulation of the mortgage market, we were very mindful of the impacts of the European Commission's efforts to apply new standards to EU mortgage regulation. And over the past few years we have been very actively involved in the negotiations on the MCD, uh, Mortgage Credit Directive, which was published finally in February of this year. And we took a twin-track approach to the work on the MMR. First, we sought to minimise the impacts of European legislation by pressing for a consumer protection regime that was very, very closely aligned with our own. And secondly, where possible, we actually also aligned the MMR rules to the direction of travel uh, of the European work. So we kind of attacked it from both sides. And that approach has meant that now when we come to implement the MCD, certainly compared to some of the other European regulators, we're actually, as the UK, quite a bit ahead of the curve, particularly in establishing a regulatory regime with the consumer uh, protection at its heart. And for firms, this means that the need to make extensive change is minimised and actually we can carry across a lot of what we already have. So also thinking about implementation of the MCD, we'll be able to do this in a way that relies on our existing mortgage regime as far as possible, minimising disruption for you and also cost for you and for us as well in the process. For example, we don't believe we'll need to change our existing rules on responsible lending, on advice, on arrears management, areas which were strengthened through the MMR already, um, and they will actually meet the directive requirements, we believe. There are also a number of provisions in the MCD where member states can exercise discretion, uh, discretion on whether or not to implement certain bits. For each of those areas, we've actually chosen not to introduce new requirements. Among those, we're not proposing a ban on commission. As you know, as part of the MMR, we found insufficient evidence to suggest evidence of commission bias um, requiring an intervention in that market, and we continue to take that view. We're not proposing a ban or restriction on consumers being able to make pre-contractual payments. And we're not um, proposing to prescribe a cap on early repayment charges. But in other areas, we will need to amend our existing rules in order to implement the directive. Uh, the Directive Requirements on Knowledge and Competency, for example. Um, the Directive sets out standards of professionalism for mortgage lenders and intermediaries and those involved in designing products and underwriters. And we consider that sellers with a Level 3 qualification, as required under our existing mortgage regime, will already meet that Directive standard. So actually, for many of you selling mortgages, it's not too much of a problem. But product designers and underwriters are currently not covered by our requirements. 
and for them the directive will impose new minimum requirements so we will need to consult on that. And our proposed approach though does not oblige designers and underwriters to obtain particular qualifications, rather the lender has the flexibility to consider the role that each individual person performs and determine the extent of the knowledge and training that are required. And we're also taking advantage of the ability to apply transitional arrangements, uh, giving firms until March 2017 as opposed to 2016 to make the, meet these new standards. But by far the biggest impact for firms, um, and an area in which we actually have no discretion from the directive, is disclosure. Now the directive introduces a maximum harmonising pre-contractual disclosure document known as the very catchily titled European Standardised Information Sheet, um, or the ESIS. And I'll, you can refer to it as the ESIS for, for ease rather than get that out every single time. Um, and this will replace our existing key facts illustration and is designed to suit the same purpose allowing consumers to compare deals and to shop around. Now we're very conscious that in some instances firms will incur significant costs in migrating from the KFI to the ESIS, which is why we'll be using the transitional provisions allowed to us in the directive. So this will allow firms doing first charge mortgage business to continue to use the KFI until the 21st of March 2019. So the directive is implemented in 2016 and it's a further three years worth of transitional relief in which you can use the KFI. However, in doing that, those firms will need to make certain top-up disclosures, uh, and they're designed to enhance the comparability between the KFI and what will be in the ESIS. And those top-up disclosures will be first information on the new seven-day light of reflection period introduced by the directive, and the directive allowed us to choose whether consumers should be given uh, a reflection period or the right of withdrawal, and we chose the former to minimise potential disruption on property sales. Secondly, firms must provide information for consumers on the potential impact of interest rate changes. Um, and that must be in the form of a second annual percentage rate of charge, designed to illustrate what an elevated interest rate will mean for customers on a variable rate. And again, many of these conversations you might be having already, but this is going to be in a standardised format as a document. And one question we're asking is whether we should retain our existing, mortgage, existing calculation uh, method for mortgages not covered by the directive, or actually if it simplifies things to just do it all in one way, and we very much appreciate your views on that. And finally, the other top-up required will be, where relevant, some extra information relating to foreign currency loans. So to minimise the cost to firms, we don't propose that these changes, these top-ups, sorry, need to be part of the KFI document itself. So during that transitional period, you could actually provide them separately as long as they're provided at the same time um, and in a usable format for consumers. But it's also worth mentioning the directive does provide a new opportunity for firms. Um, FCA authorised credit to intermediaries will be able to passport into other EU member states without being subject to new admission requirements. And mortgage intermediaries will therefore have the same freedoms allowed currently to investment and insurance intermediaries under EU law, and obviously it's up to you whether you choose to make use of that. More detail on how we're proposing to implement the directive sets out in Chapter 2 of our consultation paper. I would very much commend to you to, to read it and ask you to engage in the process um, to help make sure that we get it right. And although we have very limited scope to alter what we need to implement and when we need to implement it by, we very much welcome your views on how. Uh, how we're proposing to do it so that we can consider any unforeseen market impacts and again, as I say, make it as seamless as possible. You will also have seen that the government's own consultation includes provisions for buy-to-let lending to consumers, as it's proposed the FCA is given powers to supervise compliance with the government's regulations, and we'll be addressing those practicalities not in this paper, but it'll be the subject of another paper um, in due course. I also mentioned second charge mortgages, which are covered in the paper um, that's published today. So as I say, the directive doesn't apply just to first charge mortgage activity, it applies to second charge mortgage activity and makes no distinction between the two. So the government decided to take this opportunity to bring second charge mortgage, mortgages into our mortgage regime and it's currently consulting on the legislative changes required to do that and we're consulting on the rules that we intend to apply when that happens. Now we recognise of course that the second charge mortgage market is very important for consumers who want to borrow additional money and who have equity in their home. They can often do so at lower rates than through unsecured credit and without the need to disrupt a favourable first charge mortgage by moving to another mortgage lender. Um, particularly, we recognise there are differences, though, from the first charge market around the customer profile and the purposes for taking out a loan, uh, among two examples. So it is important that any new regulatory requirements we put in place enable this market to function effectively 
while offering consumers adequate protection from the risks associated with taking out a secured loan. And those risks, of course, at the most generic level are present whether the loan is secured by a first or a subsequent charge. Ultimately, the consumer's home is at risk. And evidence we've gathered from firms points to those risks being heightened in the second charge market. I'm sure none of this comes as a surprise to you. I mean, for instance, in terms of those risks, we know that a far higher proportion of customers in the second charge market take out a loan for debt consolidation purposes. Around two-thirds of second charge loans are actually advanced for that reason, compared to around 1% in the first charge market. But even that said, consolidating debts through uh, second secured loans can be the right solution for some consumers where it is affordable. Consumers struggling to cope with debt may feel pressured to find a solution and enter into an agreement that prolongs a period of financial stress though. And seeking to repay debts through additional borrowing rather than addressing the root cause of those financial difficulties can see people enter a debt spiral that erodes their equity and increases the risk of repossession. So the higher arrears rate in the second charge market does cause us concern. Around a third of second charge mortgages originated before 2008 fell into arrears in the first year and half suffered arrears at some point during the life of the loan. And while arrears have dropped dramatically or materially for mortgages originated post-crisis, they're still aligned with the poor tail of first charge lending that we sought to address through the MMR. So to address these risks, we believe that the key protections of our mortgage regime should be applied to the second charge market. So where a consumer customer wants to take out a second charge mortgage, um, ensuring that the product meets their needs and circumstances and is demonstrably affordable is key. And where a customer does fall into payment difficulties, we want to ensure that they're treated fairly. I think encouragingly, from our discussions with second charge firms, we know that a number have already aligned with these requirements or have plans to align, and some of their processes are what we'd already expect under the mortgage regime. So there's a lot of positives in there as well. And that's particularly true of firms who are also active in the first charge market. And although we're encouraged by this, I think it's important to take steps to hardwire those requirements into our rules and prevent poor practice. So using affordability examples as an assessment, assessments as an example, um, the high probability of early arrears may suggest that some second charge mortgages are unaffordable from the outset. Under our mortgage regime, and also as the directive requires, we'd expect firms to assess affordability on the basis of whether or not a customer can afford to make the repayments. But we know that some firms have assessed debt consolidation loans to be affordable solely on the basis that they're lower than the customer's existing monthly outgoings and that they'll decrease if they consolidate the debts without considering whether that second charge mortgage payment is actually sustainable for the consumer. And that's at the absolute heart um, of the affordability. I think as is the case in the first charge market, we propose that second charge lenders' affordability assessments should take into account a customer's verified income, credit commitments and basic quality of living costs. Both now and in the event of circumstances or an unexpected change in interest rates. Interest rate stress, rate stress, of course, remains a hot topic, and we recognise that compared to first charge, second charge mortgages may be less affected by interest rate fluctuations, but we're still proposing that second charge firms will need to factor this into their affordability assessments. Interest rates are also likely to affect other secured lending, most significantly the first charge mortgage, um, which is usually significantly larger than the second secured loan, and of course, therefore, has a knock-on effect to your ability to pay a second charge mortgage. So we propose to address this by uh, requiring lenders to also consider the impact of interest rate rises on higher ranking secured loans. And we set out in our consultation paper what we believe to be a proportionate and practical approach to this to avoid excessive costs and delays. And of course affordability is only one part of getting a second charge mortgage. It's also important that the customer gets a loan that meets their needs, where they understand the risks and where they're not persuaded to borrow more money than they actually need. And we therefore think it's important that where a sale involves interaction, customers receive advice from sellers who are appropriately qualified. And so we propose to apply um, the same MCOB sales standards to the second charge market. Now earlier I touched on um, the level three qualification requirement that already applies to first charge mortgage sellers, and we're proposing to extend that to second charge mortgage sellers to strengthen the sales process. Uh, we don't believe it's appropriate or necessary to develop a second a separate second charge exam and there are clear similarities across all forms of secured lending and this will be strengthened by the application of consistent regulation across first and second charge mortgages. However we do of course recognise that firms and individuals will need time to go through that process of achieving those qualifications. 
And at the back end of the process, um, we're also proposing to apply our mortgage rules on the handling of payment shortfalls and repossessions to the second charge market. We believe that these rules, which have been strengthened over recent years following thematic reviews into the first charge market, will provide effective protection for second charge customers in financial difficulty. But it's also important to recognise that our approach to second charge mortgages isn't a straight lift and drop. Um, we are focusing our efforts on addressing the key risks and we will tailor that regime where we feel it's appropriate to do so. For example, we're not currently proposing to introduce prudential requirements for second charge non-bank lenders, administrators or intermediaries at this time. Uh, instead, we're committing to analyse the impacts of how the mortgage regime for second charge mortgages settles down uh, before making a decision. And we recognise there will be some big changes to the second charge firms and they will need time to make those changes. We don't have much flexibility in our timetable for implementing the directive requirements, but we do have flexibility for the non-directive elements, such as the application of the MCOP sales standards and the associated qualification for mortgage sellers. So we're considering whether to stagger the timetable for these, uh, where a delay won't harm consumers. And we very much appreciate your views on that as well through the consultation. I, I can see, see it coming from both sides. But I think our overall message to firms who are in the second charge market is that you should start planning now. Uh, remember that you also need permissions to carry out activity in second charge mortgage business from 21st of March 2016. We know that the majority of second charge firms also carry on other consumer credit activities and we're currently reviewing our application forms and our processes to ensure that we can make the application process as clear and as straightforward and as quick as possible. And we expect that review to be completed over the next few months and we'll update our website with the details of that application process as soon as we can. Existing consumer credit firms have already been given landing slots for applying for authorisation sometime between August 2014 and March 2016. And the timetable for implementing the directive and our second charge mortgage regime may mean that some firms in that group uh, find that their previously confirmed application periods need to change to allow the maximum time to apply for the mortgage permissions. So those firms with an application period before the 1st of April 2015 will have to amend an application that's already progressing or if an authorised firm submits an application to vary their permission to add mortgage permissions. But I would encourage firms again to talk to our authorisations helpline um, in terms of working that through or if there's any confusion. Hopefully it's clear in our paper. I think firms also ho already holding mortgage permissions are unlikely to need to change that permission. But we will expect firms in the first charge market to notify us when they carry out second charge business under the new regime. And the consultation sets out more detail in all of that as well. And while there will be some big changes to the second charge market, we, we think they will be positive. This is a chance to apply consumer protection that's specifically designed for mortgages, not designed for other types of unsecured credit. Um, we think this will provide a more open, more flexible market for second charge mortgages. We think it will benefit consumers and we think ultimately it will provide opportunities for firms as well. So I think in closing I would just say that we have benefited hugely from the discussions we've held over the past um, year with our two industry working groups. Some of you may have been members of those groups. These helped in shaping our policy proposals. I would also hope that the constructive dialogue continues through this period. I see no reason why it shouldn't. Um, and we'll be running a series of events for firms across the country um, throughout November. More details of those will be on our website shortly. Uh, our consultation process runs until 29th of December 2014. And so I do hope you'll take the time to respond to that. Um, so I think we've done as much as we can to make the impact of this as light as possible um, by moving to that space over the last few years. I hope you'll, you'll think the same. Um, other than that, enjoy the consultation paper and we look forward to your responses um, and we'll see where we go from there. Thank you. Thanks again. Okay.